All right, so we're talking about how this guy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, came to power. So we're, we call this first section the rise of FDR. You couldn't have had this guy, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, without the Great Depression, okay? So we're gonna go through, we're gonna look at how the Great Depression happened and uh, hopefully get as far as getting Franklin Roosevelt elected, okay? So what was the Great Depression, first off? If my computer doesn't lock up on me. All right, so the Great Depression was the single largest depression in the 20th century, and some would argue the largest depression on a global scale, at least, in, in all of world history. Uh, it wasn't just an American depression. It was a worldwide depression. It was something that, 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 that uh, was caused by globalism. And we're going to see that Hoover fails to, uh, to stop this depression because he doesn't understand that we have a global economy now. You can't just fix stuff in the United States. We have to fix things in Germany. We have to fix things in in France and England and all over the place because they're buying our goods. And if their economy is not good, our economy is not good. Uh, so this, this depression starts in 1929 where we finished off the last lecture uh, when the stock market has this massive sell-off. And it's going to continue. People, people put it at different times. At least the late 30s. The most common place to say 1941, with the outbreak of World War II, U.S. involvement, and then we started coming out of the Great Depression. We don't really fully come out of it until 1954, okay? So it's a long, long depression. So why did we have this depression? One of the biggest reasons is the underlying causes of the depression were not recognized because we had all of this prosperity. In the 1920s, this time period we called the Roaring Twenties, everybody was always making money. Nobody was losing money. The stock market had always increased in value, and that led to overconfidence. Now, in an economy like this, people will tend to speculate heavily in the market. And that's what's going to happen here. Americans are going to start speculating. That means they're going to start borrowing money in order to invest it in the stock market. And what they're gambling on is the stock market is going to go up before they have to pay back that money. Well, that works great as long as the market goes up because you're making money off of somebody else's money. Okay? But as soon as that market starts to drop or even just doesn't show growth, now you have to pay back that money you borrowed at interest. So you get desperate and what do you do? You sell off your stock to pay for it. Well, the sell off of the stock causes the price of the, of the stock to go down, which makes the next person that borrowed money panic and he sells off his stock, which makes the market go down, which makes the next person panic. And the next thing you know, you have this domino effect where the market just collapses, okay? The other thing that happens in the 1920s is we invented uh, debt in the way that we know it today. Americans started buying goods on credit. The 1920s was the birth of things like layaway and credit cards. And people started, instead of saving their money to buy something, they started buying it now, putting it on credit, and just gambling that the market was always going to be good and they'd be able to pay that back. It's kind of what we do today. Americans are terribly in debt. We're doing the exact same thing. We've been doing the same thing since the 70s. Uh, well, when the market collapses and you lose all that money, those, pe those other people still want their money back. They, you still have to pay your debts back. Only now you don't have the money to do it, okay? This is the guy that was president during the Great Depression, Herbert Hoover. And you really would have thought he would have been the perfect person. Uh, he was a trained economist. He had been an engineer. Uh, had gone to Stanford University. He had 
been the person that uh, that financed the Boxer Rebellion, that you know, that, that, that ran America's uh, budget in the Boxer Rebellion. We were helping in China. He had done food relief after World War One. Been Secretary of Commerce. This guy knows how to do things, but he doesn't understand this new global economy, and he just does too little. Okay, and he's not able to to, to solve solve the big issue here. So what are the major causes? Now, guys, this is not my opinion up here. This is from an economist, okay? Uh, this is from a guy named John Maynard Keynes, a brilliant economist. Now, I don't always agree with him on everything, but, but according to him, he, these are the big causes of the Depression. Uh, first off, wealth was not evenly divided among Americans. What we had was we had the extremely rich, the extremely wealthy that were controlling entirely too much of the uh, of the wealth. They were controlling sometimes uh, 70, 80 percent of the wealth was being held by two to three percent of the population. Okay? By the way, it's even it's even more uh, abrupt than that today. The top one percent controls about 70 percent of the wealth in this nation today. Uh, second, we had we were overproducing in agriculture. Our farmers were, were producing too much. We had too many pigs. We had too much milk. We had too much corn. We had too much wheat. We were overproducing. And what that's going to do is it's going to drive the price down on the product because there's too much of it. Okay? The result of this was that farmers were not getting as much money for their milk or their pigs or their corn as they used to. Americans weren't buying it, and a lot of it was just going to waste. There was more than we needed, and we had corn that was rotting and milk that was being poured out. Uh, and what they were selling, they were selling at a cheaper price. Exports were, were declining, largely because we pushed through the largest tariff in American history. We call it the Hawley-Smoot Tariff. Uh, the Hawley-Smoot Tariff reduced international trade, as tariffs always do, always. Uh, I don't know why we keep doing them. They never, ever work. They have never worked in all of history. What, the, what a tariff does is it puts a tax on imported goods. It makes a foreign good more expensive in order to protect American businesses. That all sounds great. But what it in fact does is it makes all goods more expensive. And in this case, nations reciprocated with us putting a tariff on their goods by putting a tariff on our goods. And nobody bought our goods. So you had American goods that were just sitting on the, uh, on the shelves that nobody wanted. Uh, next, we had a very weak international economy. At the end of World War I, we had so destroyed Europe, particularly Germany, they didn't have any money to spend. Uh, their money had to go to feeding people and, and repairing their, their, their cities that we had bombed into the Stone Age. They didn't have money to buy our fancy goods. Uh, and finally, we had we had a bad monetary policy. Under Woodrow Wilson, we had invented the Federal Reserve System, uh, which is a, an independent agency that governs our, our, our money system. And uh, what they ended up doing was they raised interest rates in a time period when they really should have lowered interest rates. When you raise interest rates, you encourage savings. When you lower interest rates, you encourage borrowing. Well. When the economy's bad, you actually want to encourage borrowing so people will borrow money in order to build houses and build businesses and give people jobs uh, instead of encouraging savings, which means the money sitting in a bank. Okay? All right, so what, let, let's look at the warning steps. All these stop steps that we missed, uh, and we kind of already talked about this. But farmers were in trouble. We've already talked about how overproduction had led to a drop in farm prices. Uh, and because they couldn't sell their goods, a lot of our farmers were unable to pay their debts. As a result, what do they do? Well, they lose their farm to foreclosures. The banks foreclosed on them, and now these farmers, who have no other skills, don't even have a farm to farm anymore. They end up going to the cities and looking for jobs, and the jobs aren't there. Uh, this is a time period when 25% of Americans were farmers. 
You don't want 25% of your nation going through this, okay? It's going to severely damage your economy. We've already talked about this, but uh, but you can see most families were living on the economic edge, okay? Uh, most of the wealth was being held by a, a just, just a few people. I'm not going to go over this again because it's already been up there. I just filled it out here so you can find it. All right, so let's talk about this term buying on credit or buying on margin. We've already talked about debt, but what you're doing when you're buying on margin, again, is you're borrowing a percentage of the stock. You're, you're, you're only paying, paying part of the, the amount. So let's say I want to buy a $100 share of stock, an expensive stock. I'm going to buy one share for 100 bucks. Well, I only put $25 down. And what I'm gambling on is that that stock will sell and I'll be able to pay the, pay the rest off afterwards. Well, again, if it goes down, you can't do that. That money ends up having to come out of, your, out of your savings. And this buying on margin is what uh, led to the stock market exploitation. Well, the banks had heavily uh, uh, leveraged themselves in the market. So when the stock market collapsed, the banks lost the money. Well, whose money do the banks lose? The banks don't have their own money. That money is our money. It's the money they lost was the money of the investors that had invested in the bank. And this is the time period before uh, the FDIC, and it, it wasn't insured. So if banks went out of business, you just lost everything. Warning sign number four, several major industries were at risk. And we've talked about, about this to an extent already. We know farming was at risk. Uh, but we also know that, that, that things like automobile industry was losing money because people didn't have the money to buy them. Uh, people weren't building houses, so construction was down. Uh, the US economy also was not diversified. What that means is we didn't do a bunch of different things like we do today. We were really depending on a couple of things. We were depending on the farming industry, the steel industry, and the automobile industry. And if any one of those collapsed, the, uh, the effect on us was, uh, was deadly. And in fact, all three of them collapsed during the Great Depression. Okay? There was nothing to, to, to hold us up. I've already talked about this. I'm not going to go over it again, but uh, it's just talking about the smooth Hawley tariff, which reduced international trade. <coughs> right. All right. So how did the Great Depression affect or impact the American people? When you don't have jobs, what do you do? Well, today we know you go get unemployment. But they didn't really have unemployment in the way that we do today. Uh, some states had some benefits, but there was no federal program. So you go seeking unemployment. At most, they would give you six weeks of unemployment. Well, it's going to be tough to find a job at that amount of time. People are starving to death. Cities established soup kitchens and bread lines. People were literally eating on the government dole. Well, somebody has to pay for that. What do you do? Well, you increase taxes in order to, order, order to, to fund it. Well, increasing taxes actually hurts the people that are being fed. So you're actually hurting the economy through this. Uh, unemployment is somewhere around 25% during this time. That is massive. 25% unemployment is massive. It was even worse on minorities and women. Uh, if you were a black man, your chances of being, being unemployed are over 50%. If you were a black female, you just didn't have a job, okay? Because with the jobs, when the layoffs happened, that's the order they did it in. The black women got laid off first. Then the black men got laid off. Then the white women got laid off. Then the white men got laid off, okay? That's the way it worked. Uh, <coughs> so what do you do? You've lost your job. You're a farmer. Uh, you've lost your house. Well... You gotta, you gotta move to the cities. So we had these massive migrations to the cities. 
Americans were migrating up, particularly the places like Chicago. Uh, they were migrating really heavily into California. Uh, Detroit, where, where, auto, where cars were being manufactured. This is what was going on in this time period. What they were finding when they got there, the jobs weren't really any better those, in, in those places. So what do you do? You've got no money. You've got no relief. There's no, there's no HUD housing, no housing and urban development. So they ended up living in these shanty towns that were nicknamed Hoovervilles. These, uh, these hopeless villages. A lot of the people were World War I veterans. And it gets terrible in these, these little Hoovervilles. I'll show you some pictures in a little while what they look like. Minorities are hit much harder than anyone else is. Uh, I've already talked about how they were the, the last hired and the first fired. But Mexicans were, were hit, hit very hard as well. There was actually a repatriation movement. Mexicans, in some cases, had lived here for generations. Some of these Mexican families had lived in the United States since we were Mexico, okay? But they were sent back. They were, they were forcibly uh, uh, repatriated into Mexico. And then we're struck by geographic disaster. The 1930s, a time period that we called the Dirty 30s. And it wasn't called the Dirty 30s because they misbehaved. It was called the Dirty 30s because there was dust and sand and dirt everywhere. What happened was we had an extreme drought and we over farmed at the same time. Well, as you bring more land under cultivation and you plow it up, you get rid of all that grass that holds the ground down and then a drought happens and all that dirt starts to rise up. And as the winds came, it pushed these black clouds, they call them black blizzards across the country. Uh, it was a literal environmental disaster. We were losing topsoil in some places and burying towns in others. Uh, massive migration. People were leaving the Great Plains because of this. This is the area we're talking about. You see it comes all the way down into Texas. But that area is called the Dust Bowl, okay? Uh, right in the middle of the Great Plains. Oklahoma, New Mexico, Colorado, Texas. Uh, goes up into Nevada a little bit too. Kansas. This is a picture of a black blizzard coming in. You could imagine what this would have looked like. You're living in this house, and just from nowhere, this dust cloud comes up. Now, guys, I've never seen one in the United States, but I'm an old Marine, and I've been in a, uh, in a dust storm in, in Iraq when the sand blows, and it, it feels like sandpaper hitting, but I can't imagine what this is like. Uh, I can remember it just pushing tents over, uh, it came so hard. In these cases, sometimes it was pushing houses over. It was burying them. It was, it was like the sand dunes shifting, and the weight was collapsing roofs and stuff. This is a serious, serious problem. The last straw for Hoover, though, is going to be the bonus army. What had happened was, at the end of World War I, when we had all these great military heroes come back, at the height of the roaring 20s when we were in an economic boom, the U.S. government decided they were going to promise every World War I veteran a bonus. But here's the deal. They said, your bonus is in 20 years. <coughs> So they say, in 1937, 19, in 1937, we're going to give you a bonus. And here was their logic. Most of your veterans are 25, 26 years old. 20 years from now is about the time you're going to be ready to start thinking about retirement. Okay? You'll be in your mid-40s to early 50s, which is about retirement time in those days. So what they did is they took that money and they put it in the stock market, and they were gambling that that money would continue to grow. And at the end of 20 years, there'd be enough there that could give the, the bonus. Well, in 1929, it all disappeared and the stock market collapsed. 
Well, now these veterans want their money. 20,000 veterans march on Washington, D.C. And they say, you promised us this money. And we want our bonus now. We're broke. We need the money. Well, the money's not there. And what Hoover could have done was, Hoover could have gone out and said, look, your money was in the stock market. We didn't promise it to you until 1937. It ain't 1937 yet. Give us some time. Tell me 1930. We got five years still. But he didn't do that. He didn't explain anything. In fact, Hoover was so insulted that they would come up there demanding early payment that he sent out the troops. He sent in the U.S. Army to disband the Hooverville, this shanty town that these veterans were living in. Now think about the imagery here. We have the U.S. Army being sent in with guns and bayonets removing World War I veterans that are homeless. Okay? Some of the guys involved, Douglas MacArthur, uh, Eisenhower, George Patton, these guys all end up being World War II heroes later on. But at this time, MacArthur was already a general, but the rest of these were captains and majors. Uh, a lot of veterans were, were injured in this. Uh, and they literally lit the towns on fire, the, the, the shanty towns. Kind of give you an idea of what it looked like. <coughs> this is the Bonus Army's march on the Capitol. So you can kind of see here where they're marching the Capitol dome there in the background. Here's another picture of them as they're laying. Uh, you know, they actually camped out on the lawn of the Capitol. That's why they had to be moved. Your Bonus Army soldiers coming in. Here's police officers dragging them away. Here's your shanty town outside there. Again, they're just living in whatever they can. This is where they're living, homeless veterans, all these guys. And this is what happens to it. They literally light it on fire to get them out. <coughs> you can see the Capitol Dome in the background. That's how close this was happening to our Capitol. It was on the grounds of the Capitol. Well, who's going to get blamed for it? Herbert Hoover is going to be blamed. And he should be. So this guy, Franklin Roosevelt, is going to decide to challenge Herbert Hoover. He's an interesting character. If you don't know Roosevelt, FDR is the cousin of former President Theodore Roosevelt. They didn't like each other much. At least Theodore didn't like Franklin. Franklin was kind of hero worship Theodore. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt modeled himself after Theodore Roosevelt. He uh, he went. He was Secretary of State. Uh, I'm sorry, Secretary of the Navy, just like Theodore Roosevelt. He was Governor of New York, just like Theodore Roosevelt. He ran for Vice President with Al Smith, just like Roosevelt had ran for for, for Vice President. Uh, but that's where everything's. That, that's kind of where, where it stops. Because he was a Democrat while Roosevelt was a Republican. and He was very much a big state person while Roosevelt was not so much. Uh, they were both progressives. Uh, FDR was a uh, uh, was not the healthy man that, that, that Theodore Roosevelt was either. Although he started off that way. He was quite the athlete in his youth. Uh, in fact, <coughs> Franklin Roosevelt still holds the high school uh, record for the standing high jump in New York State. Uh, yeah, I think they don't do it anymore, but they, they did it for a long time. He held it for years. Uh, but while Theodore Roosevelt was known for being this powerful athlete, Franklin Roosevelt had been stricken with polio. And he was almost completely uh, uh, confined to a wheelchair all the time now. The polio had prevented his legs from, from operating properly. He could get up and he could stand from it, but he couldn't walk on his own. Uh, by the end of his term, he's not even going to be able to stand. So in 1932, he runs for president. And by the way, he hides his handicap from the American people. How do you hide that? Well, part of it was that the media cooperated and they didn't show any pictures of him in the wheelchair. But the other thing was that when he had to give his speeches, his son would wheel him up to the podium 
and he'd stand up on the podium and hold himself up behind it. And then they would open the curtains up and all you'd see is Roosevelt standing there. At the end of his speech, they'd close the curtain and come get him. So you wouldn't see him uh, being helped ever. Lots of pictures of him standing, but in reality, he, 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 couldn't, he couldn't do that very long. In fact, the way he stood, he had metal braces inside his pants and he would pull, uh, would lock the braces tight so he could hold his body up. Uh, but FDR manages to win the presidency. And he doesn't win it by just a little bit. This is FDR's victory, 472 to 59. FDR won all of the blue states. This is a massive defeat of an incumbent president. Herbert Hoover is done for, OK? Uh, so what is Roosevelt going to do? Well, he comes into power and immediately declares a bank holiday. This is, we have what we call the first 100 days. FDR does more in the first 100 days of his presidency than every president added up before him had done. Okay? It's the most successful 100 days in the history of a, pre a president. So what's a bank holiday? Well, he closes the banks down because the economy is, in, is collapsing. And what he's worried about is people are going to be worried about the banks and they're going to rush in and they're going to withdraw their money and that's going to cause the banks to fail. So he just shuts every bank in the country. Now, this is a time period before we had credit card or, or, or uh, debit cards that could just go to the money machine, you know? Uh, so what you did? He goes on the radio and he tells the people, our money is fundamentally secure. I know you're in a panic, but he explains to them what we call a fireside chat, that the reason the banks are failing is because you're panicking and taking your money out. If you'll just leave your money in the banks, then the banks can loan money to other people to build houses and you can have a job. And everything will operate properly. You just have to trust me, you've got to leave your money in. And to make sure you do that, he creates a new program called the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which insures the money in the bank. At that time, it was up to $100,000. So he says, look, here's the other part of it. If you put your money in the bank and the bank fails, the US government will insure that money up to $100,000. Sweet. So you're going to get your money anyway. So don't panic. And sure enough, when the banks reopen, the run is stopped, nobody panics, and he stopped, stopped the run of the bank with this. By the way, we still have FDIC. It's $200,000 now that it's insured, insured up to. Uh, the next thing he does is he pushes through the National Recovery Administration, or the National Industrial Recovery Administration, as it's going to be called later. Uh, so the original NRA here. This, what it does was it provided government funds directly to businesses to help businesses uh, fund themselves and grow. Pretty smart way to do things. Uh, you can know about that one when you're, whatever, for, your, for your next test. They have the Homeowners Loan Association, which provided low interest rate loans directly to, uh, to people buying houses. Why would the government want to be in the business of loaning money? Well, because if people will borrow the money to, buy, to build houses, that means that somebody has to build that house. It's going to create jobs. Somebody has to uh, has to build the, the, the wood for that, and somebody has to has to make the tile that you're going to put down. It creates all kinds of jobs. Uh, and then he invents the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. This is a predecessor to the WPA that your grandparents may have talked told you about. The CCC was a public works program, and I see I can't spell program. Let's just say program. Uh, but what that means is it was a make-work program. The government hired people and just started building stuff. Sometimes it was stuff we didn't even need. If you're here in Texas, uh, uh, you, you may have seen the San Jacinto Monument. We didn't need a great big monument out in the middle of the bay or, or, or on the edge of the bay in Dallas. But we got one because the CCC built it because people needed jobs. Uh, if you live in a, 
uh, a town with, with brick roads. Those were almost always CCC projects. Uh, you live in a place where you've ever seen the, the red iron brick or red iron rock houses and stuff. Those were usually CCC projects. These were ways of just giving people jobs. He does all this in 100 days, and it's very, very effective. He also shifts the Democratic Party's focus from rural America to urban America. We call this the politics of urbanism. Um, and cities are going to become much more powerful than rural America. FDR starts all this. We still see this today. If you ever look at an electoral map, like after the last presidential election, if you looked at it, the whole map looked red, but then there were all the cities were blue. That's because FDR started the system where the Democrats controlled the cities. They, they, they focused on the, on the urban areas, and it's managed to hold up, hold up ever since then. Uh, one of the ways they did it is, and I, I put government handouts up here, that's probably not the best term, but government assistance. Uh, it created loyalty to the Democratic Party at this time. And one of the bad things it does, though, is it chases the Southern Democrats out. A lot of Southern Democrats end up uh, bolting and joining the Republican Party instead. So why is this New Deal going to be so popular? There has to be a reason for it. First off, it was optimistic. That means uh, that he told Americans things, things are going to get better. And as long as we're promised that things are going to get better, we're, we're happy about it. Uh, we like an optimistic president. Think about Ronald Reagan. Uh, it's morning in America. That was his optimism. Uh, well, the optimism of Ronald, Re I'm sorry, of Franklin Roosevelt was very much that things are getting better. He used fireside chats where he would go on the radio and speak directly to the American people. Uh, and he was a better communicator than any president we'd ever had before. He had this very strange voice, was very high pitched, had this New York accent, but it was soothing to people and they felt comforted. He was, it was like, like everybody was listening to their favorite grandpas, but it was what it felt like, it, 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 the way they explained it. Uh, we trusted Roosevelt because he surrounded himself by what he called his brain trust. And these were the smartest people he could find. He would tell you, I might not know all the answers, but my advisors do. And he surrounded himself by economists and historians and political scientists. And when he had a question, he put it to them, and they argued the case, and then he made his decision based on a logical argument. Uh, he was very sympathetic to rural America. He, uh, he brought electricity to most of rural America. If you get your electricity from REA, the Rural Electri Electrification Association, and I don't know about, about down at, uh, at West Sabine, Brooklyn, but here in Wells, most of our kids get their electricity from, from we call the co-op. The co-op is REA, okay? Uh, so electricity came to us because Roosevelt said, you deserve electricity too. It doesn't have to just be in the country. Uh, he did things like, uh, like he gave jobs to people through the WPA and the NYA and the CCC. Helped the unemployed immediately. He also told African Americans that you will get an equal shot at the jobs that whites get. Uh, on all these government jobs, he put an order out there that you cannot take race into consideration when hiring people. Well, it's going to be genius, okay? Uh, FDR is going to, going to capture, capture the black vote through this. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone is going to like the New Deal. There are those people that do not like it. It was increasing the size and scope of government enormously. Uh, a lot of people argued that what he was doing was unconstitutional. He was legislating. He was writing laws from the executive branch. Well, that's, that's illegal. Our Constitution says that legislation goes to Congress. Our president is the executive branch. Well, he was clearly violating the Constitution. America's history, for the most part. 
because things were getting better because of it. Uh, these guys cared. Huey Long, that's him there at the bottom. Huey Long was a socialist. Uh, <coughs> they call him Kingfish. He'd been, uh, uh, been a senator, and he actually challenged uh, F. Franklin Roosevelt for the, for the presidency for the re-election bid. But somebody shot him, and uh, he wasn't able to uh, continue. But uh, Huey Long wanted to tax away all money over $100,000. So all the millionaires, he wanted to take their money away from them and give it to the poor people. Uh, guys like Father Coughlin, that's him up there at the top right. Father Coughlin was a conservative radio show host who started off as a supporter of Roosevelt, but then he changes his mind and he starts thinking that Roosevelt is secretly leading a Jewish revolt trying to overthrow the government. He starts calling him Franklin Rosenfeld, kind of uh, turning his name into a Jewish sounding name. Uh, the American Liberty League, they also want to stop Roosevelt. That group is still around. They've changed their name. They're called the American Civil Liberties Union now, ACLU. But it was the American Liberty League back then. All right, uh, let's stop there for the day because I've got a lot of people out and I really don't want to get so far ahead that they can't catch up. Uh, I will try and finish this lecture on Wednesday and we will try and have our test one week from Wednesday, okay? So, uh, Make sure you're doing your study guide. You've had it for about a month now. Make sure you're doing your study guide. If you got any questions, you can always call me. You can always text me or email me or whatever you need to. I am glad to help you out, okay? You guys have a good day. I'll hang around for a few minutes if you have any questions. Is that good? Nice. Good. Now I got one on you. Thank you very much. 349.